recording. Let me shrink up the PDF a little bit here before I bring it over. Okay, so if you look in the textbook, this is, let's see what page am I on here? I am on 292, roughly, or 293 is where I'm at. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, oh, I remember, the, I remember that. I have it in my, uh, I have the, that, the, that table, look, that square looking thing in my reference book. Okay, okay, cool. <clears throat> it's the chi-square test for a one-way table. So suppose we want to evaluate whether oh. there is convincing evidence for a set of observed counts in K categories or unusual differences from, we might expect under a null hypothesis called the expected counts uh, that are based on the null hypotheses, E1, E2, E up through EK. If the expected count is at least five and the null hypothesis is true, then the test statistic below follows a chi-square distribution with K minus one degrees of freedom, okay? And so they're telling you, you can look at the upper tail of the chi-squared distribution to find your p-value. We consider upper tail because large values of chi-squared would provide greater evidence against the null hypothesis. So you always do a one way to the right tail, all right? So if we go back and look at the question from the quiz, it says micro habitat associated with foraged and bed sites for barking deer in Hanan Island, China, were examined from 2001 to 2002. The region woods made up 4.8% of the land, cultivated grass plot 14.7%, and deciduous forests make up 39.6%. Of the 426 sites where the deer foraged, four were categorized as wood, 16 as cultivated grass plot, 61 as deciduous forests. Use the table below table below summarizes these data, okay? All right, okay. so do you, want, do you want to go through and actually do the, the calculation? Do you want to write the hypotheses? Do you, want, do you want to do the whole thing? I should ask you, let's start there. Do you want to do the whole thing? Um, I believe, I mean, yeah, might as well. I don't, it doesn't bother me. I mean, I'd rather know what I did wrong because I, I know somewhere I messed up. Well, chi-squared is, uh, I haven't finished grading this yet, just so you know, but it's, I mean, I have, I've been a little bit slammed the last couple of weeks, but that's okay. Um, Chi-squared is a useful technique and it actually shows up in social sciences and psychology and anthropology and pretty much any of the ologies. So what you're looking for, go back here to the textbook for a second, uh -huh. looking for the chi-squared test statistic, which is this guy right here, yeah. which is the sum of the observed, well, all of the observed and right. So I think I can do a better signal than that. Let's try that again. Yeah, it's the sum of the observed minus the expected quantity squared over the expected. Yeah. Okay. And so that's equal to your chi squared um, test statistic or how you actually calculate it, right? And I watched I watched a Khan Academy video and they said it's not really. Like you can ha write it like an X, but it's, it's not actually an X. It's not an X, no. It's a capital uh, case C in, in the Greek alphabet. And it looks totally like a C. Yeah. All right. I like the Greek alphabet. The, yeah, well, one of the ancillaries of this class is you get to learn a little bit of the Greek alphabet. Okay, so the null hypotheses would be, I mean, what, they're, what the um, hypotheses here are, is that the foraging sites are, are all equally used. In other words, the deers don't have any preference to any of, of them. So you would expect to find 4.8% of foraging in uh, the wooded regions and grass plots, we find 14.7 of them using those and 39.6, et cetera. I used LaTeX for that, I said, P under, well, just for proportion one was that I just basically took each percent and made a little LaTeX out of Sweet. E each of the things. Okay, cool. I really right. like LaTeX now. So. LaTeX is pretty sweet. Yeah. So P1 is going to be equal to what? 0 0.048. Yeah. 0 
When it, oh yeah, okay, never mind, never mind. I, when I don't see the extra zero, I kind of, my brain kind of goes, what? Oh, all right, guys, that better? Yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. And then P2 is going to be 14.7%. And then P3 is going to be equal to, what did they give us for P3 here? 39.6%. Uh, yeah, I'm actually glad I got to cut, like be at this office hour because I was telling my parents, I, as soon as I got home, I was like, I need to make it to the office hour. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, so, and then the one last thing is the other, okay? Now, they didn't give oh, us the other because, remember, these got to add up to 100%, right? Yeah, I know that, yeah, yeah. Sweet, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to use R for a calculator here. That's, I think that's where I messed up. I didn't, for some weird reason, I didn't think the, I, I knew it was a popular, uh, you know, it was a proportion population, mm -hmm. but. My brain was like, "Oh yeah, you don't, you don't need that. You only need those three, but then it." No, I, no, you need you need P four too, which is other. Uh, okay, so the way you're going to find that, yeah, the way you're going to find that is you come in and you go, "All right, go one, subtract, and then let's see, let's go get our other our proportions here. Point zero point zero four eight. And then subtract from that. Uh, let's get the right number in here. Uh, 0 0.147. And then subtract from that. 0 0.396. So, and that's just to get P4, correct? Right, exactly. Okay. Okay, so that says 40.9% is other, okay? They forge in other places besides oh, these other categories that they did. And then, I'm, I'm not going to jump too far, but then since we have those <coughs> data, uh, mm -hmm. we, could, we would use that fancy uh, command you taught us in the lab and it would spit out all that stuff. You can use the chi-squared test, yes. You want to do it that way, or you want to do you want to actually do the grunt and actually see it calculated? I'll I'll do it either way for you. Um. Probably since uh, I'm uh, I, I'll do it the grunt way. You want to go grunt? Okay. All right. It's all right. This is a small set, so it's okay. It's not too tough to do with the grunt. So what we have to do here is we got to go find out n <clears throat> to figure out. Well, f first of all, our alternate is at what? At least one of them's different. Yeah, at least one differs, right? It's very similar to ANOVA, except for it's for proportions. Yeah, I remember you said that on the videos. Yeah, it's a one-way. The ANOVA we learned was one-way ANOVA. There's also two-way ANOVA, but we don't cover that in this class. That's a, a more advanced topic. So at least one's different, right? Okay, so what we need is, so we've got P1, P2, P3, P4. And if we go back over to the problem, we've got, let's go to the, Actual quiz here, here we go. We've got observed one, observed two, observed three, observed four, right? Yeah. So we got to go calculate E1, E2, E3, E4. We need to go know, our, we need to know what our expecteds are. And, and that would be what they gave us, right? Would be what they well, gave us. they gave us, hang on, they gave us this. They gave us the percentages. Those are not the expected counts. Oh, okay. And so to get the expected counts, what we're going to need is we're going to need to calculate um, what percentage out of the total should be in P1, what percentage out of the total should be in P2, et cetera. In other words, what we're going to need is N P1. That's going to be the ex first expected. You need N P2. That's going to be the second expected, uh. right? N P3, that's going to be your third expected, et cetera. Oh, okay. So, and then that will give you, and then, okay, then you do more of the grunt. Okay. This. All right. So I'm going to do, I'm going to R do a little bit of the grunt for me here. Okay. Yeah, so, no, I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, because I'm, I'm lazy that way. So let's go to say capital E for, for expecteds is going to be equal to, okay. So let's come over here and let's build this. 
So what do we know? We know that um, there were 426. So out of that, we would expect out of the 426, we would expect 4.8% of them to be in the woods, right? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take 400, uh, where's it again, what is it, 426. R is pretty cool because it knows that if I do this times a set of them, it's gonna multiply every one of them by that 426. In other words, I'm gonna go 426 times P1, P2, P3, P4, and those are all gonna be in this, this so, uh, column I'm that put, I'm making right now. I'm gonna put that in my uh, uh, book here, right? For the chi-square here. So you can, so that, but that time C tells it do it to every single one. Well, I got, I got, but I got to do the everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got to put them all in here. So 0 0.048, it's got to go in here. Uh, my 0 0.147. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to find what exact section I need to put this in so I remember. remember. This is kind of like a general R geek thing. I mean, it would be fine to put it under chi square because this is a good place to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And plus, this is a YouTube video. I'll just watch it back. There you go. It's it is going to go up on YouTube. You can watch it anytime you need to. So. Yeah. Anyway, long one. There we go. Instead of trying to. Yeah, but probably better in some ways, Damon, just to pay attention. And then you can go back and. Yeah. And and get the notes later if you want to. Yeah, no, I just realized that. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> what that just did, what that says is take 426, multiply it by this number, take 426, multiply that one. It's basically, you can think about it, it's using the distributive property is one way of thinking about it. Uh, my good old friend. <laughs> yeah, okay. So now notice it just made a new variable E. If we hit an E, so one of the assumptions we have to check for the test is to make sure every one of those expected was greater than five, and they all are. Right. I mean, let's go back just for a moment to the book here, and it said, um, uh, da -da -da -da. "I want to stop that." You, based on the null hypothesis, expected at least five, and the whole is true. And so, we the basic assumptions we're assuming the data was was collected correctly. There are k categories, and the expected counts is at least five for every one of them. All right. Yeah. Okay, so far so good. All right, so that's your expected. So let's go make the column O for observes. And observe, that's going to be the ones that are actually. Uh, what they observed, right? Yeah, that's the 4, 16, 67, and 345. Oh, okay. So that's 4, 16, uh, 67, and 3. On my screen, they look like dots, but are those commas? What now? Are those commas? Yeah, those are commas, yeah. You have to put commas between. When you're creating a list in R, you always have to put commas between the numbers. Uh, okay, just on my screen, they kind of look like periods for a second. But it's okay, I understand. Is that better if I make it bigger? Uh, yeah. I can, I can blow them up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that's my column of observes. So if I just come in here and hit O again, see, I got that in those columns, all right? Well, yeah, that's cool. I forget about these small things sometimes. All right, so let's go, let's go calculate our chi-squared. We'll do it again. We're going to do it sort of let, us, let R help us out here, okay? Yeah. Let me just show you a, tr a trick here. If I take, see, so again, back to um, the actual test statistic, we need to take the O1 and subtract E1 and O2 minus E2, et cetera, right? Uh -huh. so check this out. If I take O minus E. Whoa. So it's, it'll do, it does it. It goes through and, and subtracts them all for me. So you don't have to sit there and type out every single problem. No, it, it knows to do it, to do it element wise. It knows to go and subtract the first one from the second one, et cetera, right? Okay. okay. Now, what do I want? You need to square them, right? Yeah, I want the sum of the O minus E squared, right? Oops, let's go in the right spot. So I want the sum of the O minus E squared, and then I want each one of those divided by E, right? Yeah. Whoa. 
So that's fancy schmancy way of writing it out. That's, that is this, that's the sum right there. So it took O1 minus E1 divided by E1, et cetera, okay? Okay, I'm, I'm following. Is all okay, is good? Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm t this is really helping me because when I was taking quiz, I, I knew I was missing something, but I wasn't sure. And when I get flustered, I'm like, I don't understand. It doesn't work out so hot. Yeah. <laughs> I told you I told you in my in my thing I was like this week was really rough. <laughs> well, yeah, I like I said I have not I've been I've really fallen behind. It's, it's just been an amazingly busy week for me and so I've fallen behind. I have not got this quiz graded yet and I got to get in there and get it done. Uh, no, That's, I understand. I'm I'm not picky. <laughs> no, no, it's more for me than anything else because if I don't get it done then I'm going to have two quizzes to grade and then that just gets insane. So I got to get get after it. Okay, anyway, so I, I can't All right, so t tell me, just based upon what you see so far on that chi-square test statistic, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? Do you think that we're going to accept the null hypothesis or reject the whole hy null hypothesis? From what I see, uh, reject. Yeah. Okay. So without even without even going into actually doing the chi squared, um, te well, that's the chi squared test statistic. But I'm saying without going in and doing the p value calculation, can you see why the p value is going to be pretty nearly zero there? Because it's going to be really, really s when you do the math, it's going to be really small. Yeah, it is. You're you're right. I mean, it's totally. On, spot on but the thing is is that the reason it's so small is because okay here it is yeah it's it's problem 6.44 cool i just want to make sure i was doing the right problem here so the reason is is that when you have a chi-square test statistics that that's so far to the right there's hardly any area whatsoever to left okay so the p value is going to be nearly zero here, let, me, let me go back to the picture for just a minute, Damien. <clears throat> yeah, no problem. I'm See, that's a chi-squared uh, distribution, isn't it, right? Yeah. When we came up with a, um, a test statistic that's like a million miles off to the right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And so that means uh, we're probably going to reject it pretty darn handily. Okay, I'm just checking my reference. Give me a sec here. I want to look. At 644 yeah. in the solutions guide just to make sure. And I used 5% as my significance. I just, I didn't Any know. reasonable significance, you're still going to end up rejecting with that big of a test yeah. statistic. Yeah. Okay, this actually makes me feel <laughs> a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, well, you could have used the, the fancy schmancy um, tool or you could have done it by hand. That's totally up to you. I mean, I believe in the homework. So I want to kind of look. I wanted to use the tool, but I, where I was getting lost was like, I knew you had to put your observed values and your expected values and you had to do chi dot square. I think it was chi square dot or no, it was something dot test. I remember. I remember it was, that. yeah, right. Exactly. It's chi, chi dot, I think it's chi square dot test. And then I knew to put um, your uh, observed in one and the expected in others. And, but my problem was when I put in the numbers, I, I had been mixing it up and it wasn't adding up to one. And when I ran the mm. numbers, it was saying, oh, you, it has to add up to one. I wasn't, and so I tried to do it by hand and then I just gave it the best shot I could. That's okay. Well, I'll definitely, Damien, I'll look at it, see what you did. At least you're, you were moving in the right direction. That's the main thing. Okay, so if we wanted to do the chi-squared calculation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we could use P chi-square, right? Yeah. Okay, so here, let's do this. Let's just so we remind ourselves how to use it. I keep forgetting about that. Put the question mark on there and it'll give you a description of how to use the thing. Okay. So P chi, P chi squared, right? You've got to give it Q. You got to give it um, 
the um, degrees, of degrees of freedom, and it's saying that the lower tail is true, right? And you have to, but in our case, you tell it false, right? Right, because we don't want the lower tail, we want the right tail, okay? So well, if you, you say one minus p square? Totally. Yeah, you can totally do it that way too. Yeah, okay. You could go one minus p chi squared and that would work also. Okay, I was just making sure that's, you know, I could still do that because that's what I, I typically do if I don't want one of that one tail. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so our test statistic, let's go ahead and round it off to 276.6, okay? Okay. And then you got... And our degrees of freedom are K minus 1, so we had four categories, so our degrees of freedom are going to be 3, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I got, but my numbers are way different than what you have. Well, that's okay. That's all right. At least you're getting that. that the test statistic was still going to be pretty ridiculous even if you forgot to put that last category in there. So with um, a p-value of basically zero because it's so small that, that R can't calculate it, we would end up rejecting the null hypotheses and um, taking in its place the alternate that at least one differs. So one of the things that's nice about doing it by hand, right, is that one of the things that you can do is I can come back here and I can get rid of the sum. In other words, not, don't add them up. I don't want. I don't want you to add them. But I want to see them, right? And if I do that, oh. right, what that does is that gives me the observed minus the expected squares divided by the expected, and I can look and see who is giving me the. You know, what are the biggest contributions to this chi squared sum? And it's the the last two categories seem to be the ones. Other and uh, what I think. I, forget, I totally forgot. It was like other and I think. Yeah, here we, no. we can go back to the to the quiz so you can see it. Other so it, something. Yeah, here, let me make it bigger. It's deciduous forest and other. Okay. Let me, let me blow this up so it's a little easier to see I mean, too. Uh, uh, I just got minimized. There we go. Cool. Can, is that easier to read like that, Damon? Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> thank you. So yeah, so the deciduous forest and the other are, are very different than, um, than what is actually out there. In other words, if we go back and look at those numbers, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the deciduous forest number was, there's 345 and you would, exp that's the, um, the observed, right? And the expected based upon the percentages of, we would only expect to see 107 and we saw 345 so they obviously prefer the deciduous forest yeah a lot more than than um the others so they're concentrating in the deciduous forest they're not spreading themselves out evenly among the other the other habitats and the same thing with the other right i mean the other is really messed up too actually that was the number i was getting my bad and i meant to highlight that one for deciduous forest but the 345 for the other and the deciduous forest, those are the ones that are the biggest, but they're all, they're all pretty different. That, that's the main thing to see is that the, um, the expecteds have them spread out and much more actually are. They, they're actually more concentrated in other habitat and deciduous forests as compared to what we would expect it to see. Oh, okay. All right, that's enough in that one. I think we beat that one with the dead deer, pardon the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the pun there, yeah. but. Yeah, uh, no, so I think we did. Catherine wanted me to take a look at, let me go back to the book here. Catherine wanted oh. me to take a look at a one from the current homework oh. assignment. Hopefully she's doing well. <laughs> I think so. I haven't, haven't heard from her in a while, so. Oh, yeah, I, I think she, like everybody else, is, is crazy busy. I well, no, and also, and also just, you know, everybody's. You know, just trying to, everybody's in different groups and whatnot. And all that. Yeah, 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 no doubt. Okay, all right. So she wanted me to take a look at 625, which was the Coast Starlighter Part 2 and Exercise 713, introduce the data on the Coast Starlighter. I'm going to my R studio so I can help her out too. Cause I mean, sure. I mean, I've, I, I did it, but you know, it, it took me a while because I, 
Right, so they want the equation of the regression line for, for the predicting travel time. Okay, so if we go um, to the, the um, I'm going to scroll up here a bit. If we go up to the earlier part of the textbook here, they give us some formulas that we're going to need to be able to make this happen. All right, if we go back up to, I believe it's the beginning of 7.2. Yeah, fitting a line by least squares regression. So you got to calculate, basically you need to know what M is and you need to know what B is, okay? So they give us a whole bunch of things up front that we're supposed to know. And then they say fitting the least squares line and they give us a couple of tools that we can use to make this happen. So this part right here, which shows up, so Catherine, if you're watching this, make sure that you go back and check out page 342, because the formulas that you need for doing this by hand using summary stats show up there, okay? So B1 is um, the estimate of the slope. And for me, one of the things that I usually have an e uh, easier time remembering this is that I know it's the rise over the run, which is the change in Y over the change in X. So that's the the variance in the y over the variance in x times the correlation coefficient r. So if I have those three numbers, I can calculate b1, which is my estimate of the slope. So let's go back to the whiteboard here for just a moment. So Damon, I'm going to kill this one so we get a fresh whiteboard here. All right, so we know. Yeah, I'm, just, uh, I'm just relaxing. So. You go. So y hat is equal to b0 plus b1x, all right? That's, that's our predictor line. So to get that, we're gonna need to know those two numbers. So b1 is equal to the standard deviation of the y's divided by the standard deviation of the x's times Pearson's correlation coefficient. So in, <clears throat> in problem 725, they're gonna give us that. They're gonna give us those numbers in the table. So then once we've got that, we can get an estimate for, um, B naught because we know that the mean and of the X's and the mean of the Y's is always going to be a point that goes through the equation of our line. And since that's true, which I guess the second form we needed wasn't on this page, let's go and scroll down. Since that's true, we can use that to calculate our slope. Okay, so. So that's using, this right here is our old pal, the point slope form of the line, and you can use that to calculate um, the actual equation of the line once you know what B1 is. All you have to do is plug in the mean of the Y's and the mean of the X's, okay? Now, if you just wanna know the intercept, there is another way of doing it. So let me give you both of those. So you can do Y, back over here for a second, Y minus Y bar, is equal to B1 times X minus X bar. And that might look familiar. So from back in algebra, Y minus Y sub zero is equal to M times X minus X sub zero was a formula of the line that you might have seen in algebra, or you might not have, you know, either way. Okay, so that's one way of getting, this gets me the equation of the line once I know B1. So that's EQ of the line. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, I'm not seeing it right now in the book, but I know I've seen it, is that I can calculate B0 by doing the following. I can say, well, look, I know that what I want is I want Y hat is equal to B0 plus B1X, right? Well, if I know, let me get a different color here. If I know, hey now, what was that all about? That's very bizarre. Stop that, you go over there, okay. Okay, so if I know what B1 is, and I know an order pair X, Y, I can plug those three numbers in, and the only number that will be left will be this guy, the guy I'm looking for right here, B sub zero. And so that says that if I take the mean of the Y's, right? 
plug that in for y hat. Leave b0, because that's what I don't know, plus the b1, well, I calculated that back up here in the previous step, and put in the x bar right here, I'll find out what the b sub 0 is. In other words, I can take y bar minus b1 x bar, and that's going to be equal to b0. All right, so enough of this. Let's go get the actual problem at hand here. Let's go down to 725. Okay, so write the equation of the regression line for predicted travel. So we've got everything we need here. We're just gonna have to parse it out of the sentence. They didn't give it to his table to give us into these paragraphs. So the mean travel time from one stop to the next is 129 minutes with a standard deviation of 113 minutes. The mean distance travel from one stop to the next is 108 miles with a standard deviation of 99 minutes or 90 miles, excuse me. And the correlation between them is 0.636. So regression line for predicting travel time, okay? So input the miles and that's supposed to tell us the travel time. So let's go right down. It's gonna take a few flicks back and forth here. Let's go right down everything. So we want, what I want to do is get rid of some of these things that I have running here right now. I'm sure taking up my computer's brain. All right, so all right, so we want to know what B1 is. So B1 is going to be the ratio of the standard deviation of the Ys. So that's going to be, they want um, the predictor to predict travel time. So the distance is predicting the time. So you give me the distance between um, two stops and it'll tell me the time between them. I believe that is what they're looking for. So that's going to be. I put 113. Wait, hold on, I'm, th I'm thinking out loud. <laughs> Well, I put 113 in, I put an R chunk for it. I said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going over there to do the actual calculations. Just a minute, Damien. I agree. With you. I just want to check real quick, make sure I'm getting these numbers in the right spot. Yeah. Okay, so cool. Me and my, my brain just like, <laughs> no, that's good. So S sub Y was equal to 113, right? And S sub X is equal to, I believe it was 99, right? Yes, S sub X yeah. is equal to 99. And the correlation coefficient R is equal to, let me get back to the right page here. Here we go. Correlation is 0.636. Okay, so B1, which is my slope. Remember, B1 is the slope. This is M right here from back in the day when we were still doing algebra, and that's M, all right? That's going to be, so I've got S sub D over S sub T. So it's distance divided by, by um, time. And I may have that bass backwards now that I think about it. So hang on a second. Yeah, no, I got, I got that right. I put it, I put it bass backwards in my drawing. I, I said it right, but I did it wrong. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so it's not that, okay? It's 113 divided by 99 times 0 0.636. All right, let's go over and do that in R. Hmm. So 113 divided by 99 times 0 0.636, okay? So that is gonna be my slope. So that's my B1. That's, let's see, we'll go out to 0.726. That's gonna be plenty of decimal places.
Okay, so to go get B sub zero, we need to go get the, um, the mean for the y's and the mean for, for the x's, okay? So that's going to be our B sub zero is going to be equal to, excuse me, get rid of that there. That's not what I wanted. That's going to be my Y bar minus B1 X bar, okay? So let's go back over here and the mean of the Y's was 129 minutes. minus my B1, that's my 0 0.726, and I gotta multiply that times my X bar, and my X bar is 108. So far so good? Yeah. Okay, cool, so let's go over and do that. Although I, I put X minus 108 on my, like, does that make a difference? Because I put, because I'm, I just remembered it from algebra and I remember that. So you did, it, you did it this way up here? Yeah, I had that. Yeah, that's fine. That's, it's, you can plug that in here. You can go X minus 108 and, um, okay, cool. <laughs> and then Y minus 129 and, put in the um, 0.726 in there and you're gonna get exactly the same answer I'm gonna get. Okay, I, f I figured so, I just. Okay, but I'm, I'm gonna go over right now and go do that over in R. So let's see, you get 129 minus 0 0.726 times 108. Okay, so 50.592, right? Mm -hmm. that. Cool. All right, so let's go actually answer the silly question from part A now. After all that, we got part A. So part A is that our predictor line y hat is gonna be equal to B1, which is 0 0.726. Whoops, my bad, I don't wanna do that one yet. We'll do B0 first. I'm thinking algebra, not stats here. It's gonna be equal to B0, which is 50.592 plus 0 0.726 times X. Oh, I wrote it, oh, I wrote it algebra way. That's okay, don't worry about it. That's, that's not, a, a, not a bad thing, it's, it's fine. But what we need to do is actually also have this in, um, in something that makes sense. So this is what, this is time, right? Predicted time is gonna be equal to 50.592 plus 0 0.726 times the distance. Let's input the distance and it's going to give you back the predicted time. So far, so good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, cool. All right. So. What's the next part of this silly thing? I believe you have to interpret the slope and say. Yeah, we're gonna interpret the slope in context, okay? All right, so let's make a new window here. I don't wanna necessarily kill this window because we've got a lot of numbers we're gonna need off of this. So how do we interpret the slope? So we know that B1, which was equal to our slope, is 0 0.726. So that number is, um, it's the change in time divided by the change in distance. In other words, this is, if you think about it, the, the delta Y over delta X thing, this is delta T over delta D. So that tells me that as you increase, um, 
for each additional mile and distance, we're going to get 0.726 minutes of travel time or 0.726 minutes of travel time per mile. Okay. I just worded it differently. I was oh, yeah. There's way, way many ways of, of wording it. We get 0 0.726 minutes increase for each mile. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, it works. No, yeah, I, I'm on, I really love the English language, and I often just go way too far with my <laughs> I would never accuse you of being verbose, really. <laughs> All right, so let's see. That's part of it. I think they wanted – what else did they want from us? Did they want uh, – um, and the intercept. Yeah, they wanted the uh, intercept the, too. Yeah, I put zero. Wait, wait. Let me hold on. One I put. I put zero comma and then the y intercepts. But then I also put. To me, this makes no logical. You're right. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing about regression. Is regression uh, many times the uh, the intercept is meaningless particularly because it's outside of the window of, of when we're actually calculating it. So what, 50.592, yeah. which means that's when T is equal to zero, right? And it's like, I'm what? <laughs> I cry. Because <laughs> I have no idea what the heck that means. I went, it, when time zero, I traveled 50.529. Does that mean I had to go 50 miles to get to the train first or something? So it doesn't make sense. Unless you can stop time. <laughs> or yeah, right, exactly. Unless you're a time lord or something, right? Okay, so it doesn't make sense in context of the problem. And that, that's going to be actually relatively common that the um, intercept has no practical meaning. It just is part of the model. Okay, so that was all part, this was also part of part B up here. So let's go take a look at part C. Part C, I think they wanted r squared for the regression line and then interpret r squared in terms of the application. Okay, so r squared is simply just r quantity squared. So that was what? It was going to be equal zero to point 0 0.636 squared, right? Okay, so let's go over to r and do that. chunk real quick because I thought I had it there. Okay. Okay, so what, 0 0.04? Yeah, it's, yeah, 0. Point, wait, for me. 0. 0.404, 0. excuse me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, me, I, I read it wrong. My bad, sorry about that. So yeah, just take 0. 0.404 and that's what R squared is, right? Okay, so remember that what R squared is, it's the amount of variation in the Ys that is predicted by the variation in the X, okay? So what that would say here is that approximately 40.4% of the variability in the time is accounted for by the variation, or varying the X. In other words, it's explained by, by, by travel, by distance. Yeah, okay. I thought it was, I thought it meant the strength of the relationship. It, that's this number. This one tells okay. you, it's really, it actually, I take that back. I mean, I mean, it, really, it does. It still tells you that. But the way you got to think of it is that R squared is a percentage. The best way to think about it, R squared is that this is 40.4%. And as you move from, let's say, um, one mile to two miles, okay, on the x-axis, because remember, your x's are, are your distances. You go from there to there. The Y should vary also. The Y is going to go up, right? The time's going to mm -hmm. increase. But how much of that increase is explained by, for by the model? Well, about 40.4% of it is. Oh, okay. So as you, as you switch, as you keep moving here, if you're going from two to three, then every time it's, you know, about 40% of that variation from the one step to the next is going to be predicted by the model and the rest of it is just random noise or or you know stuff that we that just doesn't fit the model very well okay cool all right part d uh, i did plug and chug i just took 
the one the time that they gave me and I plugged it into the model. Yeah, so we got 103 miles. Use the model to estimate the time it takes for the starlight to travel between these two cities. Okay. So, yeah, exactly. That's what we want to do. We want to use the, let's put the model together and we'll go to R to actually get it done. So our model was what? Y hat is equal to? Zero point, or no, you do it bad. That's right, you do it different. Yeah, 50.592. Plus, let's see, what was my slope again? 0 0.726. 0 0.726. And then we want to put in here. 103. 103, okay. Yeah. All right. We'll the same answer, oh, you're getting exactly the same answer, yeah. Yeah, but yeah so let's I see. If you want to read the numbers to me, so I don't have to keep going back and forth. 50.592. Yeah, 592. plus uh, 0 0.726 and then re or bracket or no you can't add uh, time symbol yeah half to use a time symbol uh, it was 108 right uh, 103 103 okay so I don't know about 125.37 minutes or you could I rounded up to 126. Yeah, that would make sense. That's fine. I think that's the book answer too. So, but if you gave 125.3, that's fine also. Uh, okay. <laughs> Either way. So, so this is 125.37 minutes. Okay. All right. So now what do they want from us? That was D. Boy, this is a long problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's really long. Uh, right. They want the residuals. Okay, so from that one. Okay, so we need to get the residual. So the actual time it takes is 168 minutes. Travel from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles. Calculate the residual. Explaining the meaning of the residual value. Okay. So what is a residual? Now, it's usually given by a little e for residuals. Okay, and it's the y minus the y hats. So, or, or another way of thinking about it, it's the observed minus the predicted. So you do 168 minus 126. Exactly. And I got, when I ran that chunk, cause I'm lazy. Yeah, you go guy, that's good. Uh, I got 42, but you're gonna get a decimal. Yeah, 42 is good, it works, you know. I, yeah. I just, I try so, 168 minus, minus 125. 125. Yeah, 125 is 37. So my original 42.63. But it, you know. And then, what did I say? Uh, I said it's positive, so we underestimated the time. Yeah, yeah. We when I mean, that's pretty obvious looking at it too, right? We we said it was going to get there faster than it actually did. So, yeah. so yeah, the model underestimated it is another way of saying it. Okay, one last one, and then I get to go eat dinner. <laughs> Yay, dinner! Yeah, I haven't eaten yet. I'm, I can feel it. My blood sugar's dropping. Okay, so suppose Amtrak is considering adding a stop at the coastline 500 miles away from Los Angeles. Would it be appropriate to use this model to predict the travel between Los Angeles and this point? And based on my previous math experience, I said no because you're extrapolating. You don't you don't have enough data to yep to go rocking the cows by there, Damien. That's exactly it. You're outside of your your data. Okay, the the this was between Seattle and Los Angeles, which is not. 500 miles was not in there, right? If I remember correctly, we yeah, probably have to go look at the first time they talked about it in part one. And I remember uh, the book says extrapolation is dangerous or something like that. It is. You don't do it unless you have real good reason um, to do it. And then on top of that, you've got to be full, full disclosure. You've got to let your viewing public know that you, you know, extrapolated to get this number, explain to them why you're doing it. 
Yeah, so that's what I said. I just said it's extrapolating. It's not a good idea. To... Right. Okay, good. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to bother trying to write it down. So, okay. Damien, is that okay for tonight? Yeah, the only other thing was just uh, a question about the written final, but I can just message you about that. That would be great because, um, actually, if you wouldn't mind, would you go ahead and put that in the Q&A form? Because I'm sure if you got that question, I'm just going to have to put it there anyway. Okay, I'll just do that. Yeah. <laughs> so enjoy your dinner. Actually. I will. Thank you. And I will talk to you next week. All right. Have a good night. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.